Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Peterson. Welcome to the Ministry Wives podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. Here, we have honest conversations about the realities of the ministry wife life and how to keep our hearts tethered to Jesus as we serve Him. I am so excited today to share with you my conversation with Jeannie Cunyon. She is a preacher's kid and understands what it's like growing up in a ministry setting. She has five boys and has written some really beautiful grace-filled books about parenting. And my favorite is Mom Set Free. On this episode, we talk about overcoming mom guilt and breaking free of it. And I think all of us, when we hear mom guilt, we understand what that means. And she so graciously puts words to things that I've struggled with and that we've all struggled with. So if you are a mom who feels like it's all on you for who your kids are meant to be, if you obsess about the church people and what they're thinking and saying about your kids and you work so hard at image management, if you feel like a fraud because your ministry life is so different from your family life, and if you feel the weight of all your mess ups from yesterday and the pressure to get it all right today, this conversation will meet you where you are. And I pray it'll be an encouragement to you. So join me friends in my conversation with Jeannie. I've been looking forward to this conversation. So welcome Jeannie to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Well, Jeannie, you are a best-selling author and speaker, and I, I think it's interesting when we talk to authors what their last and latest work is because we get insight into what their journey is with the Lord currently, and I know that you have a, a devotional coming out in October called Closer to God. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it is my first devotional. It's called Closer to God. It is a 40-day pursuit of God's personal presence, and I am deeply, deeply excited about it. I think this might be the book I'm most excited about releasing. Um, it is 40 days, but it's every day is a question, and so we're answering pressing questions that help us better understand what it looks like to live in the presence of God, to know His personal presence, to know his personal presence when we're standing at the sink, to know his personal presence when we're on our knees in prayer for our kids, to know his personal presence when we're in the car, just to be able to live knowing that not only are we the dwelling place of God, but that he is around us and with us and to experience and enjoy that. I think there's, I've had so many conversations with women who just don't feel his presence, don't feel the joy of his presence. Mm -hmm. Um, it feels like it's for other Christians and not for them. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we're looking at questions that help us better understand how we can enjoy God's personal presence. So we're talking about the pursuit of holiness and the practice of repentance and things that get a really bad rap, mm -hmm. but are actually so life-giving and freedom bringing when we understand them in the context for which we're meant to. So I'm just really, really excited about helping people better understand how they were made to enjoy God's personal presence, right? He's not hiding from you. He's not holding out from you. It's not only for certain Christians. We are, if you have put your trust in Jesus, God wants you to enjoy his indwelling presence in a deeply personal way. Um, and so I'm really excited about that coming out October 8th. Ah, oh, that is so good because I think in ministry wife life, it's easy to kind of get on the ship or the train and just keep chugging along down the track mm -hmm. of doing what you know you need to be doing for God, but you're yes. not inviting him in with you. Yes. And because in ministry, we do know so much about him, but I think so many of us are missing the experience with him every single day. The intimacy. Yes. It's so interesting that you said that because that's what this devotional was birthed out of. I, It is being published a year later than it was supposed to. I had to call my publisher and say, I'm burnt out. And it was exactly what you just said. I said, I am doing so much for God and I just need to spend some time with God. And so I'm asking you to give me a year because I had just released uh, Don't Miss Out, which was a book, and then Never Alone, which was a Bible study. And after two intensive years of study on the Holy Spirit, I was 
I was just doing things for God. And I love to do things for God, A, because I'm a doer Mm -hmm. and B, because I love him and I want to serve him. Mm -hmm. But we fall into that um, place of just doing things for him or for, I was reading the Bible to teach it instead of just to cultivate intimacy with him. And so they were so kind to give me that year. And I had no idea what the devotional was going to be about. I just said, I need a year. And so I decided to do the Bible in a year, which I've never done. Mm -hmm. And it was such a sweet time of intimacy with God to just read it and be with him and go from Genesis to Revelation. And it was probably about nine months in that I knew that I knew that I knew that what this devotional would be about was Mm -hmm. enjoying his presence because he was really convicting me about repentance and the pursuit of holiness, which is not the pursuit of perfection, very different things. Mm, That's Um, great. Right. We're going to get to that. Um, So it was out of that doing things for God that this devotional was birthed. I just went back to enjoying him and um, I'm just excited to share it. Yeah. And I think that that's such a great reminder for us as ministry wives. I just, if you listener, you are hearing this and going, oh my goodness, that is so me. And that's so where I'm at right now. I have missed the intimacy with, with Jesus. Ask him, invite him into that space, but then also reach for this book and, and walk along a guided kind of hand in hand encouragement through his word for 40 days and, and really help focus you on regaining that intimacy with him because it will lead to burnout if we're not abiding with him and in infused with his strength. I've been there too. And so I think what the premise for how this even this book even came about speaks so much to those of us who serve him on a day in and day out basis in ministry. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited. I can't wait. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this season, uh, Jeannie on our ministry wise podcast, we were talking about all things family life And today we're going to talk about being a mom in ministry Mm -hmm. and specifically dealing with mom guilt. Now, when I say that, I'm sure most of us moms listening get it. We, we know what mom guilt is, but um, I had to look it up because I'm always interested in, in pushing past my assumptions of words and really pulling down what they are. And here's what uh, mom guilt is. It's the feelings of guilt and shame that some people feel when they don't live up to their own or others' expectations in their role as a parent. Hmm. So that is where we're residing today. And your your name came to the first of my heart when I was praying through planning out the episodes for this season because your book, Mom Set Free, just released so much of my try hard perfection controlling parenting that I was doing with my teenagers. Mm-hmm. And it was such life giving balm to a very wound tight heart <laughs> that I just, I just knew that I wanted to bring a conversation about this to our listeners. And so I'm just so grateful that you um, are able to join me on this. Well, I, I, um, that, that resonates. I mean, I wrote it because the Lord knew I needed it. So I, I join you today and I speak from a place of wound tightness and <laughs> Lord, every day reminding me to unclench my fists that are trying to control outcomes um, and to be open handed to his plan that oftentimes does not make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, And I love that you looked at mom guilt because I haven't actually thought about the actual definition of it, but I would add to it, you know, we're not living up to our own expectations of ourselves uh, or the expectations that we believe others have of us. But I think there's another one, and I think it's maybe the biggest one, which is we're not living up to the expectations we believe God has for us, right? That I'm not only disappointing my kids, but I'm letting down my God by my imperfect parenting. And um, that was a big one for me, that that this this guilt runs vertical and horizontal, and um, it it, it can leave us really stuck and really devastated, which is exactly where the devil wants us. So um, I'm excited about the conversation because I think there's that extra layer of disappointing God when we get it wrong um, or our kids aren't, you know, bearing the fruit that we so desperately want their lives to bear from the seeds that we've planted and the timing that we'd like to see it, you know, so it's real. It's real. The guilt is real. 
That is so true. And I love that aspect of not wanting to disappoint God. And we feel like we have, and that's a whole, that's just a deep, deep layer of, Mm -hmm. of shame that we can get stuck in. And it really impacts our own relationship with the Lord um, and keeps us stuck. There's no reviving if we live in that. Okay. So you obviously have wrestled through this Mm -hmm. pressure, this mom guilt firsthand. So you are a mom. Tell us about your family um, and how many kids you have and um, kind of where you're at as a mom. So Mike and I have five boys. Um, They range from 27 to eight. Um, Our oldest is Andre. He just graduated from Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee with a theology degree. He just joined our family five years ago from an orphanage in Haiti. Um, And he has been such a blessing and a gift to our family. Um, And then we have our firstborn, Cal, who is uh, about to be a sophomore in college. And then we have a son who's about to be a senior in high school. We have a freshman in high school and we have a third grader. So we have wanted every season, yes, uh, which, you do. Keeps me, which keeps me very humble <laughs> um, and very tired. Um, yes. but I, I, every time I get mm, ungrateful or complain about anything going on in our lives or in our parenting, my husband says, babe, it's everything you prayed for because I always wanted six boys. Uh, we made it to five and then we got a male dog, but you know, he's like, listen, you, you told me we were dating. You wanted six boys. Like, you know, I will assure you that the Lord doesn't answer most of my prayers like that. Uh, <laughs> he did answer that prayer pretty specifically. And, or I could say differently, he is the one who planted that desire in my heart and he just fulfilled it. Yeah. Um, but it's, it keeps me immensely humble. Um, Isn't that the truth? And yeah. gives you such opportunity to practice everything that the Lord has shown you and you have shared with us through your books and your writings. And yeah. just keeping it real, mm-hmm. I think, is what um, I want to do in conversations with women. And I just so appreciate your realness mm-hmm. in the way that you uh, talk about it uh, in your books. Thank you. Um, and so we've talked about mom guilt and, and the three different ways in which we're disappointing the expectations of ourselves, other people, or God. Mm-hmm. And in what ways have you experienced that in your own parenting, this feeling of mom guilt? Oh, I mean, you know, it's interesting because I used to think of mom guilt in terms of it just being a purely bad thing. Like, got to get rid of mom guilt, got to get rid of mom guilt. But sometimes mom guilt is good because it tells me something is off. It tells me that I've done something that I need to uh, repent for or seek forgiveness for from my kids or from God. And so if if you told me I could only tell a young new mom one thing, I would tell her the significance of being willing to ask for forgiveness. Mm, with your kids. With your kids. I think it's so unbelievably profound. And yeah. I'm grateful what does that, that sound like to you. How do you, what does that sound like when you go to your kids? How do you do that? I'm really sorry. I just spoke to you that way. Um, <laughs> will you please forgive me? I'm really sorry. I lost my temper. Um, I'm not excusing what you did. You know, it's like the whole forgiveness thing, right? It's not saying that what you did to me or the way you spoke to me or the way you lied to me or the way you hid that thing from me is okay. But my response to you wasn't gentle, right? The Lord's kindness leads us to repentance. Like I'm always thinking about wanting to model the Lord's heart in the way I interact with my kids and I get it wrong more than I get it right. And so I have multiple opportunities to just say, Hey, I want to model God's heart to you in this thing. And I didn't do that well. Like my whole goal has become pointing them to Jesus in every way, in every situation that I can. It's just the freedom that comes, that came for me when I wrote Mom Set Free, realizing that I was never intended to be their savior, which I tried to be for a really long time, Mm. but that I have this freedom to point them to their savior. And that can sound so cliche, but it's just unbelievably true that- when we are trying to be perfect for them, we are trying to step into this role that we were never meant to play. I mean, one of the primary things we're meant to do, if not the primary thing is to point them to Jesus in all things. And one of the best ways we can do that is in our weakness, right? Where Paul said, now I'm glad to boast about my weakness. Like not only am I not ashamed of it, but I'm going to brag about it. I'm going to boast about it because it allows 
you to see my need for grace and it allows God's power to be made real through me. Mm-hmm. And that is our job as parents to just be like, hey, I'm human too. Like, you know, I, I spent a lot of time coming down on my kids, right? Like, how could you? Who says that? Who do like just shame based parenting because I was carrying a lot of shame. And when I was freed from that, the language changes. It's not who does something like that. It's, oh, I mess up every day too. Let me come alongside you. Let's go to the cross together. So I just want my home to be a place where my kids know that I am deeply, madly in love with Jesus. Mm -hmm. He is everything to me. But I fall short of his glorious perfection and righteousness every day. And I am free to confess that and seek forgiveness for that. And then it's not an excuse, right? Then to allow them to see the transforming power of grace in my life, Mm -hmm. right? It's not just a saving grace. It's a transforming grace. And so it's wonderful to be willing to say, I'm sorry. But if we find ourselves having to say, I'm sorry for the same thing over a long period of time, then we have to be honest with ourselves about whether that grace is rescuing us only, or is it also transforming us, right? Is it, is it moving us little by little, one step forward, even if it's one step forward, two steps back, is it moving us toward holiness, Mm -hmm. more Christ likeness? Are we staying stuck in that pattern of, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right? Mm -hmm. Because grace, grace should be changing us little by little. Sanctification is a painfully slow process, but it's a real one and it happens by grace. But, um, I've just found a lot of freedom to say I'm sorry and to just tell them that I need Jesus as much as they do. And I have, I will tell you, I have really witnessed the power of that as my boys have gotten older, that um, we, we are so far from a perfect home. And my boys would be free to be on this podcast with me and tell you the things, you know, how they mess up. But what I do see in them, one thing I'm really grateful for is I see a willingness to come clean. Mm, that's big. And receive the cleansing of Christ. Mm confess, Mm. to say, I'm sorry to one another, to me, even if it's not right away, there is a freedom in our home to say, I confess and I need Jesus and his forgiveness is abundant and free. Mm. And it's just really, I think it's really, really powerful, especially for ministry families, because there is a whole other, as a preacher's kid, I didn't mention that, but I grew up as a preacher's kid. Mm -hmm. Um, in a Presbyterian evangelical church, try to make sense of that charismatic Presbyterian church. Um, But I had a, I had a wonderful experience as a preacher's kid. Mm -hmm. Um, But I understand and appreciate the amount of pressure on ministry leaders and their kids Mm -hmm. to have to say, I'm sorry, as little as possible, Mm -hmm. right. To be, and yes, there is an extra level layer of responsibility to those that God has put that mantle of leadership on for sure, mm-hmm. but you still fall way short, way, way short. short of God's holy standard every day in some way, if not in your actions, in your thoughts and your motives. And so there is this freedom to say, I know I'm in leadership and I know I'm supposed to be, you know, leading people toward Jesus. But one of the most powerful ways that we do that is letting people see how much we need him. Exactly. And that's what confession is. And that's what um, asking for forgiveness is. It's our desperate need for Jesus and not being able to do it on our own. And I think sometimes we get tripped up thinking that um, a faith-filled life is one that is not necessarily riddled with mess ups and, and needs because I'm so, so connected with God that I don't have, I'm kind of on a a gradual up. Mm -hmm. But when I kind of came to the end of that for me, because I was so frustrated that my idea of what I should be was vastly different than what I was dealing with on the inside and inside my home. And I mean, we just have to say it, that parenting is one of the most hum- humbling, I almost said humiliating, but humbling. <laughs> it can be that too. <laughs> Humbling places because it shows you the extent of of what you can't do. Yeah, and I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, as I began to 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 release the need to be a perfect person in order to have a billboard faith, mm-hmm. I began to admit my need and to God first, but then it began to leak out into my friendships, into the Bible studies I was teaching. 
And there's such a cohesiveness that happens with people when they know that their leadership is on the same broken path. Yeah. And I think that it starts with us to set that model, not only in our churches, but in our homes, and then allow our people, our children to to follow that and have the freedom to do that because we've done it first. Yeah. It sounds like that's what's what you've set in the in your home. And from a third grader all the way to a what your oldest is 20, 27. 27. Yes. I mean, I just I just think that that is so important and I'm so grateful that you are um, living that out with your kids. What kind of benefits have you seen with your boys? I mean, you mentioned the fact that they're able to come clean because they know that there's no weird uh, illusion that you have to be perfect to be yeah. in your family. But what other things have you found as a, a positive outcome of being able to ask them for forgiveness? Uh, I think, you know, just the authenticity runs through so many things. Of course, listen, I'm, I'm not kidding myself. I know there's things my husband and I don't know about. (laughs) We don't know at all. I'm certain of that. Um, but I, I just want them to have, I want them to own their faith and have an authentic faith. And, you know, this is really where we get into talking about just those really unique pressures that we have as parents to um, control or want to control outcomes. Like there's so many things that we as parents um, feel the pressure to control. Um, I always say our, our, our goal should be obedience, not outcome. And, I'm, and I work on that every day. Like, I just want to be obedient to what God calls me to do as a mom, not focused on the outcome of my effort. Because I'm a very, like, I just want to see the outcome of my effort, right? Like, Lord, I'm doing the things. Like, I know the spiritual things I'm supposed to be doing. We're reading the Bible and we're praying and we're memorizing scripture and we're going on mission trips to Haiti and we're <laughs> serving in our local community and we're, you know, we're doing all the things. And, and we, this is a really hard thing to say out loud, but it's true. We think that God owes us outcomes based on our obedience to him. I can get really upset with him or, or angry. Honestly, we had a pretty brutal conversation. God made the other day as I was pulling weeds because I just said, Lord, I just, I don't know what you're doing with this one particular child. I just don't get it. Like, and I, I know that you made me a promise a couple of years ago and it feels like we're moving further and further away from that Mm -hmm. promise. And I know you can't lie. And I know, I know your voice. So what is going on? Um, and, and then I find myself going, oh, Jeannie, you're like, you think he owes you something here. Like you think you know better than him. Like you think that he has dropped the ball. Like you, his timing is not your timing. His ways are not your ways. Scripture tells you that really clearly. So I can go into that place of like, Lord, what are you doing? Like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing based on what the Bible tells me I'm supposed to do. And where are you, you know, where are you and, you know, holding up your end of the deal here? And he reminds me, you know, my ways are not your ways and my time is not your time. And, um, but I think there's, we, you know, we, first of all, we take Bible verses and we, we take Proverbs and we turn them into promises Mm -hmm. and then we get really discouraged and upset. I know since you read mom set free, you know what I'm talking about and you knew it anyways, but I really hone in on this in the book about, we take Proverbs and we make them promises and then we think God has failed us. Mm. So, and it's, um, and we hold God to, you know, our expectations as if we know better than he does. Mm. And I do it. Um, and so I want to talk about like, what are some of the pressures that we feel not only as Christian moms, but as Christian leaders or ministry people in ministry, um, there's a list in the book. I want to name a couple of them to see if it yeah, resonates with people. Um, the pressure to orchestrate a picture perfect future for our kids, the pressure to be a perfect example for our children to follow, the pressure to create, keyword being create, a saving and vibrant faith in our children's lives, the pressure to produce, keyword being produce, Christ like character in their lives pressure to shield them from the ungodly influences of culture, pressure to protect them from hardship and suffering, the pressure to ensure they fulfill their potential and purpose. Man, as they get older, that's such a big one. Like you don't want to see them waste what God has so kindly deposited in them. No, and as a mom, you see it. 
Yes. You see it, but you are not in control of it, sister. I'm not in control. Yes. It's the outcome that pressure you had vision in your mind. Yes. Yeah. The pressure to prove you have it all together in front of other moms. Big one for ministry wise. The pressure to earn God's love and the way you parent the kids he's entrusted to you. These are all real pressure. Like we, yes. we carry all of these. And, and until we name them, I don't even know that we carry them. And when we can name them and then apply truth to them and be set free from them, mm. it radically, radically changes the way we parent. And we begin to trust God with the children he has entrusted to us. And we plant those seeds, but we know we don't produce the fruit, right? We oh. model deep, authentic relationship with God, but we cannot we cannot force them to believe it or to choose it or to own it in the time frame that we want them to do it, right? So, I mean, we've already touched on the perfect example, but um, yeah, there's just so many pressures that we carry that God never, ever, ever intended us to carry. And I want moms to lay down what God has not entrusted to them mm -hmm. so they thrive in what he has. Mm -hmm. So we can plant those seeds and release the outcome and that fruit to his sovereignty mm -hmm and his faithfulness. And it's so hard to do. So and hard. a lot of days it doesn't make sense. And on the days for me that it doesn't make sense, I just have to keep, I just have to keep going back to, you've never failed me yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I look at scripture and you're a faithful God, you know, yes. like you, yes. you're a faithful God. I don't think I'm going to be the first one you, you, you're not faithful to. Um, but it sure doesn't make a lot of sense to me right now. It's such a, it's such an act of trust. You know, you said parenting really humbles us. I said in my first book, it not only does it enlarge our hearts, but it exposes all of our weaknesses, yes. right? Yes. Like weaknesses I knew I had just got massively magnified when I became a mom because he sanctifies us through parenting. I mean, Absolutely. he, if we will allow him to, if we will cooperate with the Holy Spirit, if we won't, that's a different thing. Then we don't really get sanctified through parenting. We get stuck in our sin and our shame, and that's where the devil wants us. Um, but if we will allow the Spirit to sanctify us through our parenting, um, he, he will do it, and it will be painful. Um, and we will see things about ourselves we don't want to see. But there's freedom and forgiveness at the end of that. And, and it changes how we, it brings joy back, honestly. I mean, the truth is, right, when we're trying to control all the outcomes, there's just no joy. And when our kids don't see joy, why do they want to follow Jesus if we have no joy, right? What are we modeling that they want? Um, and so it's really hard to have joy when my, my fists are clenched mm -hmm. and I'm angry that I'm not getting the outcomes I want. And listen, I think oftentimes our anger is good. It's righteous. Like it's not a bad anger. It's like a holy anger, right? Like we want to see our kids find and follow Jesus. We want, we don't want our kids to miss out on a life with Jesus. We don't want to see them waste what God has deposited in them because they're they're being stubborn um, or they're having doubts that are drawing them up. So it's, this is a mostly, I think, a good and righteous anger because we want them to know their Lord and Savior in a deeply personal, life-changing way. Um, and it's painful when we see things in their lives that um, are not in alignment with God's best for them, right? But still doesn't mean we can control it and try and do it, control it doesn't do them or us any favors. And I think sometimes it even pushes them further away. So it's just this crazy journey of trusting oh. God and residing in the suffering, residing yes. in the unknown, residing and having to day after day, trust him when you don't see any movement forward in your own mind. Yeah. It, okay. it's, it's to live in that space. Yeah. Oh, it will just, then just mush your heart yep. more than anything. And so I think that there are many um, ministry wives who are listening and who are in that place of trying to control the outcome because they feel the pressure that it's all on them to get it right. Yeah. And then you've got everybody looking, you know, you know, you've got all eyes on you. Why is your child not doing X, Y, or Z? Or I've had really interesting conversations with uh, women in ministry through my ability to 
the gift God's given me to write and speak and travel. And I have had so many conversations with ministry families who have felt free to be honest with me about some of the things their kids are secretly wrestling with some of the things their family is secretly wrestling with and they can't expose their kids. They can't talk about their kids struggle because he's 10 or he's 14 and they can't talk about, or she's 12. And so they can't, it's like, how do you live an authentic life and let people know that you're human too. And the struggle is real in your life too, without compromising your child's, um, privacy. It's, it's a really complicated thing to do. Right. And so I always, you know, I just remind people, moms all the time, like everybody's going through something in their homes that you have no idea about. And I can tell you some of those ministry wives that I'm, that I'm thinking of, I think when people would look at their lives from the outside or think about their kids from the outside, they would think that everything is pretty darn awesome. Yeah. And the truth is because their kids aren't Jesus, they have struggles and sins just like we all do. And so I just hope anybody who's listening today would just be reminded that you're not alone and you're not the only one. If you are going through something hard, something um, painful, something that makes no sense, and it feels like all the other ministry families' kids are running hard after after Jesus and not messing up, I just want you to know they're they're going through something else. They're going through something too, because we all need Jesus. You know, we, we all have our, our things and, um, what a beautiful thing to know that we need him and he is available to us, but it's painful and it's hard when you're in ministry because all eyes are on you and there's a pressure there. And I felt it, I felt it as a preacher's kid. And the funny thing is it didn't come from my parents. Um, it came from people in the church. My parents were so filled with grace and, And they also um, just made me feel like home was a safe place to not have to be. I I struggled perfection anyway. So I did it to myself. They didn't do it to me. But I did feel it in the church, you know, the eyes on us. And how was I doing? And and I felt a lot of pressure to be a quote unquote good girl because Mm -hmm. I cared deeply about my parents' reputation. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved my parents and I... And I loved our family. And so there was a lot of pressure for me to perform as a preacher's kid, not because of them, but because of everybody in the church expecting, you know, using Bible verses as weapons that if, you know, that, you know, if you can't, if you can't control your home and your kids are off the path and you have no right to lead a church and stuff like that. So I felt it from people in the church and there was nothing that my parents could do about that other than just reminding me how loved I was and how much grace there was. But Mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing to navigate in ministry. Um, And you just have to keep reminding your kids that even when everybody in the outside or people in the church are putting pressure on them or all our eyes, all eyes are on them, that that's not the way God feels. That's not the way God sees. That's not the way God is thinking about them, that his eyes aren't on them trying to catch them. Um, And he's not expecting them to be the perfect poster child for everybody else in the youth group and that there is freedom to be honest about um, the things that we struggle with or mess up with, because it just reveals what we already all know to be true, which is we all fall short of the glory of God. And we all come to the cross with nothing in our hands to bring. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think when, when ministry families can somehow embrace that and live that out, it can be a powerful um, influence on the church, but of course, you know, some, some are going to do what some are going to do, you know? Yeah, I know. And it's that controlling outcomes and the pressure for that, not yeah. only internally in your family, um, and individually as a, a mom, but also externally with the people in your church, um, yeah. who, 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 whether it's said or unsaid, I think there's just that expectation sometimes that you just feel as a, a as a child. And it's interesting to have your perspective from being a preacher's kid to Mm -hmm. now having walked through your life and being a mom now and looking back on those times and and being able to say it was nothing that my parents did. And I think sometimes that we try to craft the perfect 
um, or even counterbalance maybe some of the limitations that you have in ministry with your family and try to overdo it in order to, to make it right. Or feel like being in ministry, uh, you want your kids so much to own their own faith, mm-hmm. but yet it's a part of your life to go to church every Sunday and Wednesday and things and how to let them own that. And I love what you just said. You just bring them back to who Jesus calls us to be and who Jesus says we are Mm -hmm. and use that as a contrast Mm -hmm. to maybe what they're feeling from church people. But I think that that is a a sweet grace filled approach for anybody who's listening. Who's like, yeah, we feel the pressures is to have those kinds of conversations with your kids. Yeah. Then realize that. And this is what I did if the outcome, if their behavior did not correspond with what I felt like I was investing in them, then I must've gotten it right. And I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And from your book, mom set free and through a conversation already, there's it's, we don't have that much control. We don't. I have a quote in the book that says what we get wrong, what we get right. And what we get wrong does not determine who our children become. And Mm -hmm. it's, very simple, but it's very biblical. What we get right and what we get wrong does not determine who our children become. You can get, I know a lot of, I know a lot of people who got it mostly right and their kids have walked away. Doesn't mean they're not going to come back. And I am now seeing from my own boys who they grew up with, they were raised in families who had no faith and planted no seeds and they have found Jesus in college, Mm. FCA or, you know, it's like, so You can get a lot wrong and God can redeem it and you can get a lot right and God will use it, but maybe not in the time that you want. I mean, our, what we do does not determine it. I I will say this, we are significant, but we are not sovereign. And if we can remember that, if we can remember that we will be so free, we are, I'm not saying we're not significant. I'm not saying that what we get right and what we get wrong doesn't impact them. It massively impacts them. I mean, We got to, we got to give this all we got, you know? Um, But we're, so we're very significant in what we do with our kids. It's very, we play a massively significant role, but we are not sovereign. Ooh. And let that settle. Right. Come on. There is freedom in that. That is amazing. There's also frustration in that because we want to be sovereign, right? So (laughs) some days there is freedom in that. And some days there's frustration because I want to be sovereign. I want to see what I've done bear fruit in the way I want to see that fruit, but I am not, I am not in control. And that is the truth. I mean, we can't be what we're not. That's right. And we're not sovereign. We're not sovereign. We don't write the story. Uh, We're not the Holy Spirit. You know, we try real hard to be the Holy Spirit. You know, we try to, we try to do all of the things that are his job and we're no good at the Holy Spirit's job. He's really good at it. So we should let him do it. Um, there was a quote in your mom set free book that says, ultimately it's the Holy Spirit's heart work Mm -hmm. and not the parents hard work Mm -hmm. that produces fruit of the spirit in their lives. Right. Thank you for reminding me of that today. I needed that. (laughs) True. Right. We think it's our hard work. My hard work is going to produce the fruit of the spirit and it's not, it's the Holy Spirit's heart work. Mm. Um, we get to partner with him. We have to partner with him. We're commanded to partner with him as parents in what he wants to do. But um, but we're just partnering with him. We're not producing anything. And so, you know, the other cool thing, I know we have to wrap up, but the other really cool thing that happens then is because we've talked about mom guilt, but we haven't talked about mom glory. They equally need to be released, right? I because, love mom glory. Tell me right? about that. Right? Yeah. I did. Look what we did. Look how they turned out, you know? Um Love no, that. sister. that's the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't steal the glory. Like, yeah. yeah. So that's mom so guilt, is, you know, we, we think that everything that went wrong in their lives was because of us and mom glory is we, we want to think that everything that went right was because of us and yes. neither are true. Neither so are true. Let go of the guilt, let go of the glory, um, you know, seek to raise them in the, in the knowledge and the love of Jesus and plant those seeds and be obedient to God to raise up the kids he's entrusted to you and the knowledge of the word and the power of prayer and the power of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and then open those hands and trust him with the kids he's entrusted to you. Oh, that is so beautiful. I am talking to myself today. (laughs) That is how it is. Well, I love that because we are continuing to lifelong learn and um, just our own words, your own words are speaking to you, God's words through what you've written in this book. And I just say for those of you who are listening, and this is just a a drop of um, grace on a heart of your heart that's really thirsty, I would just recommend uh, you getting mom set free. And so many of my mentors in life and marriage and in parenting are those that I've never met because met because they're through books mm-hmm. of, of, of men and women who love Jesus and who have gone there and provide words and walk me through seasons in which I am blind. I have no idea how to get through it, but I know that this is not how God has called me to live. Mm-hmm. And mom set free was one of those in a significant time in my life that just created such a balm of grace, which I knew grace, we all sing amazing grace, but how does it really apply to your parenting? And I promise you this conversation that Jeannie has in her book is really like stepping alongside a mentor as a mom and learning how to parent in the confidence of God's grace. So, Mm -hmm. and you know, a couple of my girlfriends, I shared it with them after I read it and then we kind of talked through it together. So it lends itself to a great books, book club study, So anyway, I'm just, I always hate to leave conversations when we haven't said all that there is to say, but we trust that the Holy Spirit will continue to lead each one of you who are listening. And then if the Lord so just pushes on your heart to to get this book, I would strongly encourage it because it is just from a sweet, grace-filled friend who has been there and is there, who can kind of point you to Jesus along the way. So Jeannie, there's so much more. (laughs) But I think that we did it well, and um, I just pray that the Lord will use our conversation into the hearts of those listening and help them live set free. Amen. Thanks so much for listening to the Ministry Wives podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. If this conversation was helpful to you, please share it with a Ministry Wife friend. Also, you can subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast platform to make this content easier for others to find. And you can find this podcast and other helpful resources at ministrywivespodcast.com. And I'll see you here next week.